Michael, um, how did you come to illustrate Lucky Button? Well, as often happens, um, I was lucky to be asked by Michael Morpurgo <laughs> if I would like to illustrate it. And I've done more than 30 books with the other Michael. And I always know it's going to be <clears throat> an adventure. I mean, it could be an enjoyable, fun adventure. It could be something which is dire and, and uh, rather grim. But um, even if he writes a really grim story, there's always optimism and hope at the end, if not early on. And uh, the Lucky Button was that kind of story in a way, because it is very, very serious um, about children in dire need, as many children still are. And so it had a kind of relevance um, which appealed to me. So did you already know the Foundling Museum and the story of the Foundling Hospital when you started this one? I kind of came across the story years back through William Hogarth. When I was an art student, he was very much a hero of mine. And so I got an inkling of the story then, not realising that some of his best pictures <laughs> are in the Foundling Museum. And uh, it's been a real treat to, to discover that. Thank you, yeah. Um, was there anything about this particular brief that was unusual? Uh, there wasn't anything particular about this. Each, each book was a new adventure. And uh, with Michael, the joy about working with somebody like Michael is that his work is so varied. Um, over the years, we've done classics like Robin Hood and King Arthur and Joan of Arc. We've done books about animals like a rainbow polar bear. Um, and also quite serious, grim stories, particularly about warfare and conflict. Um, and so each one of those, in a way, is a new, uh, I was going to say challenge, but that's a bit pompous. It's a new opportunity to draw things and to draw things which maybe I haven't drawn before. And this was the case here, that that particular period, I mean, I've done Dickens, I've done Shakespeare, but this particular period, uh, no. And I went back to my Hogarth books to check up on the architecture and the fashion and so forth. So that was, that was really good to be able to use one of my heroes as um, research. So how do you approach a project like Lucky Button? Um, do, you, do you go off and do sort of quite a lot of research into what people would wear or the sort of architecture? Or? Yes. Um, one of the things I like doing very much is going to where it happened and sketching there. But of course, this all happened years and years and years ago. And fortunately, the Family Museum staff provided me with amazing visual references, which were historically correct. I mean, years ago, I went to the Hogarth's house in Chiswick because being a fan of his. But I decided not to go back this time in case I started putting in things that wouldn't be there at that point. So I, I just used the reference which the Founding Museum gave me, knowing it was correct. But I must say that the sketching has been one of the joys of, of my life. And I remember my first day going to Saturday morning art class, age 11, the teacher, Mr. Hudson, gave us each little notebook and a pencil and took us outside the art school to draw the real world. He didn't want us sitting in the studio making stuff up. He wanted us to draw the real world and that's something which has been a mainstay really of me. And it's given me all kinds of excuses to travel <laughs> to exotic places. So, so are there any um, locations in, the, in Lucky Button that you did go and visit, especially for... No. Not this time. Because <laughs> not, I, did, I just really seriously didn't need to and was a bit, um, a bit wary, really, of, of putting in stuff that just wouldn't have been there. I mean, I, I go past Hogarth House regularly because I live in that part of London. And I'm conscious of the big, you know, road going by there, double dual carriageway, et cetera, et cetera. But the museum gave me such wonderful pictures of how it was back in the day that uh, I wanted to stick with that. So what's your kind of working progress? What are the different stages to making a finished illustration? When I get the manuscript first off, I read it. As I read it, I underline 
the bits I think would be visually good, things I would like to illustrate. And um, the other thing about that is that you have to make sure you don't put all the pictures in. There may be a, a very exciting chapter and the whole thing could be illustrated with a dozen pictures, but you can't do that because you don't want to overload one bit at the expense of the rest of the book. So it has to be staggered through the whole thing. So that's another decision you have to make. Um, and I tend to do little pencil scribbles for my own sake to see how will I capture this scene? Can it be done with you know, a small picture? Does it need more expanse? Is it, is it a landscape? Is it uh, full of detail, architecture, and so forth? So that begins to suggest the size of the pictures. Um, and gradually that's how you go along. So I'll do little pencil outlines. Then I like to show Michael Mulpergo quite early on what I'm visualizing. And he will have a look and have some observations on this. And um, I'll make adjustments, as he suggests, because it, he's dreamt this thing anyway. But also sometimes he sees things in the drawing which encourages him to change the text slightly. And so it becomes kind of ping pong at that stage, back and forth, batting the thing back and forth. I mean, he's very much like the about king, uh, ping pong. He's very much the king ping. And I'm rather more, I'm a bit, bit more of a pong about me. So. Um, but that's the way most of these books um, evolve. Then, of course, you need to show that to the publisher at an early stage. And they have their input as well. Well, having done the, the little pencil sketches and shown them to the other Michael, I'll then start drawing them out uh, full size. Now, I said earlier that I didn't want to, or you shouldn't, um, gather all the opportunities for full colour into one or two chapters. It, it needs to be spread evenly through. Similarly, the size of the pictures need to be spread through. But I use the small pictures to manoeuvre the text. So I get the big spaces for the pictures in the right places. Um, and this is a bit of, well, it's like a jigsaw puzzle, really. So I'll get the story all typed up and I cut it up, leaving gaps where I want to put the pictures, put them in, and then I'll show it to the publisher. And he will then set it in the same, the right type size, so make sure it all works. And uh, once that's all agreed, then I can start on the finished pictures. And that really is just transferring the pencil sketches onto the uh, watercolour paper, which is quite heavily textured. So I like to get the texture to hold the, the watercolour and so forth. And I use the same paper when I do the black and whites. The black and whites could be with pencil or it could be with black and black ink wash, but I want the texture to be the same in the black and whites, and so I use the same paper. Having drawn in pencil the um, pictures, uh, I then start the fun bit, which is watercolours. And uh, I start from the back, like from the sky or whatever, the background, thin washers, and that's the fun bit, having the uh, colours merge here and there into one another. It's a bit of you can't really control it, but that's the beauty of it. It's kind of, um, it just does it. Um, and then working forward through the middle distance to the, to the characters and so forth, and adding more and more detail as I come along, and may, eventually maybe adding some pastel to give it more density as you get closer. So it's building up from the background. It's, it's, it's very, very obvious. And uh, the only thing about watercolour is that it's very difficult to conceal mistakes. But you can kind of make the mistake look like something else, or cover it with pastel. And the more pastel you see in my pictures, the more mistakes I've made along, <laughs> along the way. But it's, it's, that's, you know, it's just something I've always loved doing, is having the uh, thing about the watercolour, is letting it, letting it do its own work to some extent and then building on what the watercolour has done.
Is the process of illustrating someone else's novels different to the process for illustrating your own? Um, well, y yes. I mean, I tend to write my own stories and I'll write them with the pictures in mind and then as I start to do the pictures or work the pictures up, I then start getting rid of lots of the words because the story is told in my books probably more in the pictures than, than it is in the text. The text kind of links or uh, various episodes or time changes and so forth. Somebody else's book, of course, that's already done. And so the challenge really is to um, just try and A, please the writer, it's very, very important, uh, by being true to his vision, as far as you can imagine it, and also, you know, being flexible enough to take on board their criticisms. And uh, together you build something which hopefully you're both pleased with. And it tends to make a better book. Um, one of the two of the publishers I work with tend to be more picky than others. But I quite like that because often, although I might be a bit resentful at the time, I think, well, hmm, they've got a point. And the book ends up being better because it's got, had more input from other people. <laughs> yes, I know how that is. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that's, that dialogue. Particularly if the, if the publisher's got a good designer, uh, because they have, they can visualise how this book's going to be and so forth, and how you can change this a little bit. So it's, again, give and take, it's a collaborative thing. And uh, that's really why I like working with Michael Mopurgo, because he, his stories are so varied, but he also writes great pictures. His stories are visual. So who decides on the kind of overall balance between images and text? Is that you know, the publisher, the author, how does that work? Um, it's me really. I mean, uh, to decide is probably not the right word. I set it in motion by doing it the way I think it should be. And hopefully it doesn't have to be changed too much from that. But it is this balance of spreading the work, the pictures, evenly, fairly evenly through the picture, through the book and um, if it's in colour, you know, deciding where the colour should be and where it can have most effect. When someone's flicking through the book, you want to be kind of encouraged to go on to the next bit because it's going to be fun and colourful and whatever or exciting. Uh, if it all happens at the front or all in the middle, then it doesn't work quite the same way. It's like doing a movie, you know, you want people to, you want, it's a page turner. And uh, so you plan it in that way. So how do you choose which events in a story to illustrate? They kind of suggest themselves. Obviously there are, there are key moments in the story um, which offer themselves straight away. But as I said earlier, to get them so you have the most amount of colour, uh, space, for those key moments, you need to manipulate the text by putting in the smaller ones. It's, it's like, I don't know, editing quick cuts in a movie, I suppose, to get to the set piece, and then you move on to cut, 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 and then another big, another big scene. On some of the drawings um, that are on show, there are page numbers on them, or there are little notes which say, top or bottom of page. How, who makes that kind of final decision? If I put top or bottom, that's me leaving it to the designer, how the text is going to flow. And um, so obviously the, the size of the picture could be either top or bottom, but depending on how it relates to the text on that page would determine whether it should be top or bottom. Whether you read the text and then see the picture, or you see the picture and then read the text. Uh, that's all it is. I, mean, I, I should have rubbed those notes off. But, really intriguing for people. but I leave it on so that the designer can make that decision for themselves, rather than me stipulating it has to be there. Because he has his, he has his own vision of the overall book, of course. How do you decide what an individual character will look like? Well, again, there would be clues in the text, 
and then there may be a description of some of the characters. Um, but then you get it like from the, his personality, you know, is he serious, is he fun, is he, is he the age and uh, so forth is, is obvious. But um, I think it's mostly you get the, the clues from the, from the story. Usually they're, you know, fairly well described by the author. And if not, then you'll do them in a way that emphasizes the character of that, of that person. You know, is he, is he gloomy? Is he, is he uh, fun? Is he, uh, you know, bright or sinister? And then there are various devices to make somebody look sinister, of course, by the lighting and so forth, by the way they stand. Mm. So the ghost looks quite sinister to begin with, but then you start to see that he's actually got quite a friendly face, I think. Yes, I had a, a, an old friend in mind when I did him. He's an old chap who lives in St Ives in Cornwall, and he has got that long face, and the longish hair, and uh, sometimes you see him sitting in his window looking out, and you say, ooh, uh, and then you, you know, speak with him, and he's, he comes alive and tells his stories and things, and I thought that was the kind of character I based him on, somebody who, when you get to know them, they're more than they appear to be at first sight. Did you find it daunting to um, illustrate a character that's as well known as Mozart? Uh, no, because there are portraits of him at that particular age, so I could make sure that what he looked like and what he wore was more or less correct. And uh, yeah, it's part of the job is to draw people who, who can be recognised. And um, you know, early on in my career, before I was doing so many books, I was uh, working for newspapers and magazines here and in America, and I'd sit in on interviews with politicians and whatever and draw them, and you know, I needed to get them to look, well, to be at least recognisable. Um, that's, that's part of the part of the job, really. So do you have a favourite um, character or moment in, in the story of Lucky Button? Um, I think the key moment, really, is Coram seeing the children in the street and deciding that something has to be done. I mean, that's the heart of the story. It's the heart of the family museum. And that's the bit I thought I felt was central to the whole thing, and the, the bit that um, you know reconnected me with Hogarth, and that was the bit that I really thought, in a way, um, I would have been happy if Michael had spent more time back then, but I could see why he wanted to make it relevant for today. But that was for me was the real story, the start of everything. How do you feel about the fact that some of your drawings are going to stay and become part of the collection at the Foundling Museum? Well, um, you know, it's an honour. Uh, just looking around the walls and seeing these amazing pictures that, to, you know, I think that some of my little scribbles will be part of this is, uh, is really wonderful. Um, you know, you think, when I do the pictures, I'm not thinking of them as works of art. They are part of a book telling a story. But for them to be appreciated as having worth in themselves is uh, rewarding, pleasing. Well, we're uh, delighted to have them, I have to say. <laughs> oh, good. But again, it is the company in which, you know, the the Family Museum is just this fantastic collection of pictures. And just to repeat myself yet again about Hogarth as one of my giant um, inspirations. And uh, you know, I thank him for <clears throat> uh, all the inspiration he's given me over the years. And I thank the Family Museum for all the assistance they gave me in making the book happen. <laughs>